We've talked about the great Maori explorers who came through this area so long ago and named its features as they went. Well, hundreds of years later, they were followed by the European explorers who did exactly the same thing. First up was the great navigator, James Cook, who was frustrated by bad weather as he came through this area, which both obscured the coast and kept him out to sea on his first voyage around southern New Zealand in 1770. Hence the dotted line on his famous chart and his erroneous assumption that Stewart Island, Rakiura, was a peninsula rather than an island. Cook had no better luck on his second voyage in 1773. Approaching from the south, having spent the previous few months exploring Antarctic waters, the crew of the Resolution saw land again for the first time on the 26th of March, 1773. Aiming for Dusky Bay, they had instead in view the white cliffs of Chalky Island at the entrance to Chalky Inlet. But bad weather foiled Cook again here. Darkness and mist made it too dangerous to come in close, and that night, a squall pushed him out to sea. Next morning, forced northwards, Cook instead decided to go into Dusky Bay. The mystery of Fovo Strait would endure on European maps for another 30 years, and it would be Americans rather than the English who would solve it. They were whalers from Nantucket, a tiny island off the New England coast that became synonymous in the 19th century with whaling. A link immortalised in the classic 1851 novel, Moby Dick. Nantucket had remained neutral during America's War of Independence, but many of its whaling ships were seized by the Royal Navy. Forced to choose between prison and operating under a British flag, many Nantucket whalemen chose the latter and relocated to Britain. One such was Captain Eber Bunker, an experienced Nantucket whaler who began operating English vessels out of London in the 1780s. In 1791, he commanded a vessel taking convicts out to Australia, and he was just amazed at the number of sperm whales that he spotted off the New South Wales coast. Offloading his convict cargo, he immediately set out to explore these whaling grounds, and thus became the father of whaling in Australia. Further voyages followed through the 1790s and took Bunker further and further south as he explored the southern whale fishery as well as the seal rookeries along the southern New Zealand coast. In due course, other Nantucket whalers followed Bunker south. One of those pioneers was Owen Folger Smith who made the first map of Fovo Strait in 1804. He had spotted it from Ruapuki Island while on a sealing expedition, taking a whaleboat through the strait he made that first chart of it. Known to Māori as Te Ara Akiwa, the path of the whale, after a legendary whale said to have chomped its way through the land between Bluff and Stewart Island to create open water, the strait takes its European name from the New South Wales Lieutenant Governor, Joseph Fovo, who made Smith's chart public in 1809. Poor old Smith, his audacious whaleboat journey and all the names he marked out on his chart have long been forgotten. Meanwhile, Eber Bunker made a new and more thorough survey of Fovo Strait in 1808. It included a lot of vital new information about this very challenging part of the coast, and one of the most crucial was the identification of Preservation Harbour, as he called it, showing the shelter provided by little harbours like Cuttle Cove here. It's likely that the name Preservation Inlet actually comes from this detail on Bunker's chart. There was also a small but significant French contribution to naming of this area, even though the man who bestowed the names never came anywhere near this place. He was Jules de Blosville, a midshipman on the French naval explorer Dumont d'Urville's vessel, the Coquille, better known by its later name, the Astrolabe. The French explorers were in Sydney in early 1824, planning the New Zealand leg of their great scientific expedition around the Pacific. De Blosville sought out Captain William Edwardson, not long returned from his groundbreaking trade mission to southern New Zealand on the Snapper. Edwardson was generous with his information, sharing the detailed charts he had made and giving the young Frenchman a full account of all that he had encountered on his five-month voyage the year before. 
De Blosville also gathered information from Captain John Grono, and with this advice, he made a detailed chart of Chalky Inlet and the coast of Fiordland, anticipation of coming this way. In the event that never happened, the French expedition of D'Urville instead focused on the northern end of the South Island. But it was de Blosville's chart the name this arm of the inlet as Edwardson Sound in honour of the captain of the snapper. The other arm he named Canaris, and he also named Puisica Point, likely after a fellow French naval officer. Another 40 years passed before any more formal map making was undertaken here. It occurred as part of the systematic hydrographic survey of the New Zealand coast undertaken for the British Admiralty between 1848 and 1851 by the paddle steamer Acheron. It was led by Captain John Lord Stokes, who had served on HMS Beagle earlier in his naval career and become a friend of the great English scientist Charles Darwin. Stokes was nearing middle age and a somewhat lugubrious character by the time he came out to New Zealand. His grumpiness wasn't much helped by his wife dying on the voyage out either. Nor does he seem to be much impressed by New Zealand or New Zealanders when he got here, but boy could he make a good map. The Acheron set out for preservation net from Ruapuki Island in January of 1851. Stokes had taken on some old whalers to act as local pilots, including the renowned Tommy Chaseland, and also commissioned the 100-ton sailing ship Otago to act as a tender. The two boats were repeatedly driven back by strong winds until finally, on their fourth attempt, they made it in here to Welcome Bay and were able to drop anchor with much relief. Next day, they moved around to the more sheltered Cuttle Cove and they spent the next three weeks here undertaking their surveys. And unlike today with this glorious weather, they experienced unrelentingly dreary conditions. There was one bright spot to enliven their stay. On the 1st of February, as the survey neared completion, the Anglican Bishop of New Zealand, George Augustus Selwyn, showed up in his yacht, the Udine. The bishop had been on pastoral duties in Stewart Island and fancied a side trip down to the Auckland Islands. But concerned about the accuracy of his chronometer, a vital tool for navigation, he decided to check it against the Acheron's instruments. Selwyn epitomised the Victorian ideal of the muscular Christian because as well as being a bishop, he was in fact a qualified mariner holding a captain's ticket. Having caught up with the Acheron party here in Cuttle Cove, he appeared next day on deck fully kitted out in his liturgical vestments and held divine service, preaching a fine sermon that made a very strong impression on all those gathered here for this really unique occasion in this extremely isolated spot. After completing the survey of Preservation Inlet, the Acheron party set off for the neighbouring Chalky Inlet, the paddle steamer taking the sail-driven Otago under tow for the short journey. But terrible weather pushed them back twice to Cuttle Cove. On their third attempt, Tommy Chaseland skillfully piloted the Acheron through this long, narrow passage between Gulch's Head and Balleny Reef. The Otago, however, pitched so violently in the stormy weather that its towing hawsers snapped and the little boat was left to its fate in the strong winds. This dramatic incident gave names to both Broker Drift Passage and Otago Retreat, this sheltered stretch of water east of Coal Island and beneath Pusica Point where the little Otago finally found safe refuge. Captain Stokes was no more impressed with Chalky Inlet than he had been with preservation. He described it as the usual dreary landscape being piled with timber from shore to mountain summit. Notwithstanding his surprising lack of enthusiasm for this landscape, Stokes produced maps of the highest order. Like many of those he made on the New Zealand survey, his charts were still in use over a hundred years later, and in fact many of them have only been superseded in relatively recent times. 